The next item of business is topical questions, and if a member wishes to request a supplementary, they should press the request to speak button during the relevant question or enter the letters RTS in the chat function if online. And at question number one, I call Megan Gallagher. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it plans to appeal the decision of the Court of Session that the UK Government acted lawfully when enacting a Section 35 order in relation to the Gender Recognition Reform Scotland Bill. Cabinet Secretary Shirley Ann Somerville. We note the judgment and will consider its terms. Devolution is fundamentally flawed if the UK Government is able to override the democratic wishes of the Scottish Parliament and veto our laws at the stroke of a pen. Mm. The Scottish Parliament passed this bill with a large majority, including members of all parties. It's not really an answer on the time frame, though, is it, Cabinet Secretary? Uh, SNP ministers were warned on multiple occasions that their gender self-ID bill threatens the protection for women and girls in Scotland. However, the SNP ignored our warnings. The scandal of the double rapist Isla Bryson proved that predatory men will try to exploit self-identification to gain access to vulnerable women's spaces. But the SNP ploughed on regardless and took the UK Government to court to get this bill enacted. So does the Cabinet Secretary think that the £230,000 wasted on this court challenge was money well spent? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, so, presiding officer, until ministers make a decision on the appeal, these are still live legal proceedings, and it does restrict uh, what I can say on the matter. Uh, but uh, with reference to some of the examples uh, that the member gives, can I point out that that is under the current Gender Recognition Act um, as passed uh, by Westminster um, and appropriate right the way through uh, the United Kingdom? But on the matter of uh, the the issues that were debated at Parliament. Can I point out that at no point did the UK Government um, suggest or threaten um, or even um, approach the subject of a Section 35 being ordered as this bill went through Parliament? Um, it was, uh, it was subject to two consultations in public and a very, very large amount of parliamentary scrutiny. So while the government is uh, disappointed with the judgment, we will take time to reflect on that and will come back with our decision or on the appeal in due course. Megan Gallagher. No answer on the time frame, no answer on the amount of money that this bill has already cost the taxpayer. Opinion poll after opinion poll has shown that the SNP's gender bill remains unpopular with each of its provisions, such as letting 16-year-olds change their legal gender, being opposed by a large majority of the public. So when it comes to wasting further taxpayers' money with a potential court appeal, will the Cabinet Secretary be listening to the public and ditch this bill to, for good? Or will she be in favour of her Green Coalition partners who want to spend endless amounts of public money getting this flawed bill enacted yeah, instead? Yeah. Cabinet well, I'm sure Megan Gallagher must be aware that the costs are already in the public domain because I answered a parliamentary question on it. So we're certainly not hiding anything on the costs eh, to date. And the reason why this was an important legal challenge, and it wasn't a decision that we took lightly, we considered it very carefully. But there is an emerging pattern of interference in devolved yep. matters by the UK yep. government. Like they the routinely now ignore constitutional convention that the UK Parliament will not legislate for devolved issues without the consent of the Scottish Parliament. In 2021, the UK Government, of course, referred the UNCRC and Corporation Bill to the Supreme Court. They have now ignored legislative consent decisions yeah. of this Parliament on several occasions, such as the European Union Withdrawal Act, yep. the UK Internal Market Act, the Professional Qualifications Act and the Subsidy Control Act. Yep. There are also several instances in which the UK Government has refused to acknowledge the Scottish Parliament's view that legislative, legislative consent is required, yep. such as the National, Nationality and Borders Act. As we have seen with the breaches of the Seoul Convention, once this sort of interven intervention has happened, the UK Government will find it easier to justify using this power again and further erode devolution. Thank you. And Cabinet Secretary, I need to no go to the next for standing question up for the, and the next Scottish supplementary Parliament. question. The supplementary uh, will be from... Karen Adam. Thank you, President Officer. And I agree with the Cabinet Secretary that the Court of Session ruling was a demonstration of the fundamental flaws of devolution. Of equal note, last Friday will have been disappointing and traumatic for many. 
Will the Scottish Government go give an unequivocal commitment to continue to do all that it can to support the community? And what assurances can the Cabinet Secretary give today that any decision in relation to the ruling will be treated with the utmost sensitivity? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. So the Section 35 order does raise very serious questions about devolution, as I've said in my previous answers. But we do, of course, acknowledge the specific impact on the trans community in Scotland. Yesterday, I had a series of calls with LGBTQI and women's organisations, and I heard about the disappointment and dismay in the trans community. So I want to be very clear that no matter what happens with this legal challenge, the Scottish Government remains committed to the LGBTQI equality. That's why we're taking forward legislation on ending conversion practices in Scotland, why we've published our non-binary action plan, and why we're taking forward steps to improve access to NHS gender identity services. Supplementary, Paul okay. I'm very grateful, Deputy President Officer. When the Cabinet Secretary made a statement to Parliament in April outlining the intent to take this legal action, I asked her about those wider supports uh, for trans people in the intervening period because a vacuum is created in any legal process. Um, and she said at that time that although the Government viewed the bill as important, it was not the only area they are working on to support the trans community in Scotland. So can she update the Chamber further in terms of what is being done to support trans people right now and in any further intervening period uh, before the Government takes a decision? Come, Secretary. Uh, can I thank Paul O'Kane uh, for that um, question? And he did uh, quite rightly raise uh, the wider and uh, varied concerns of the trans community when we discussed this um, item in the Chamber previously. Uh, I mentioned some of those aspects in my answer to Karen Adam around the non-binary action plan, which uh, was a very important piece of work uh, that's been undertaken by my colleague Emma Roddick. And we are uh, absolutely committed to taking forward that end of conversion practices bill uh, before the end of uh, the year. Uh, we're very keen to make sure we're fo moving forward um, on this and particularly around aspects around health services uh, where I know there are a number of concerns in the trans community. We have started to see improvements there but there is absolutely still much more work to do. Supplementary, Ash Regan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The court judgment has vindicated the concerns of women's rights campaigners that the Gender Reform Bill would negatively impact on the operation of the Equality Act and therefore on the protections for women and girls. Now that the government has been forced to face the folly of their position, will they take this timely opportunity to apologise to women's rights campaigners for dismissing their concerns as not valid? Cabinet Secretary. Well, clearly, all the way through the passage of the two consultations and of the bill, um, there were meetings um, with a varied uh, number of groups, those who supported the bill, those who supported the bills but suggested uh, changes, and those who were vehemently opposed to it. Uh, but what I would point out to the member is that the judgment um, actually although it was based on the gender recognition, is around the aspects around the Section 35 order, which, quite frankly, draws a corch and horses through the devolutionary process. And that's something I'm disappointed that the member is not more concerned about. Yes. Yes. Supplementary, Jamie Green. Uh, thank you. Um, 86 uh, MSPs from across the political spectrum supported the underlying aims and principles of the bill. Just as equally, there are many who undoubtedly would not support any form of uh, change to gender reform in legislation. But given that many of us who did support those principles did so under firm reassurances from ministers that the legal advice they had sought was sound, uh, can I ask if it would now seem prudent for the government to make some of that legal advice public, if nothing else, to demonstrate that it acted in good faith with Parliament? Yeah. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, clearly, neither the Scottish Government or UK Government uh, routinely um, publish their legal advice. So this isn't something that's a special significance to the Scottish Government, but also exactly uh, the same process that the UK Government uh, would uh, um, hold to as we've discussed the Section 35 order. Uh, but what I would say to, to Jamie Green is he's quite right to point out that there were differing views as this passed through, uh, but it did pass through Parliament. This is a bill that passed through with the consent uh, of the large majority of MSPs, including people from all parties, and it's disappointing that the voice of the Scottish Parliament uh, has been vetoed at this nature. 
Um, question number two, Alistair Allen. To ask the Scottish Government, in light of the letter from the UK Foreign Secretary to Scotland's Constitution Secretary, what its response is to reports that the UK Government may withdraw Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office support for Scottish Government overseas meetings. Cabinet Secretary Angus Robinson. Thanks, Presiding Officer. It would be helpful to the Member and to the Chamber to provide some uh, background and context. In April, the former Foreign Secretary James cleverly wrote to me and issued inaccurate and misleading guidance to UK overseas missions regarding the Scottish Government's international engagements. I wrote to Mr Cleverly seeking agreement and consultation on how the guidance could be amended or withdrawn. I did not receive a reply. I then received another letter from Mr Cleverly in October raising the matter of meeting between the First Minister and the Prime Minister of Iceland. This letter also contained inaccuracies and I wrote back to Mr Cleverly, but again I did not reach a re uh, receive a reply. This week I received yet another letter, this time from the new Foreign Secretary, Lord David Cameron, including the threat referenced by Dr Alistair Allen. This is all the most surprising, as Lord Cameron had a few days earlier cancelled a meeting we were due to have this week to discuss these issues. The Scottish Government's only interest in pursuing our international work is promoting Scotland's interests. Yesterday we published detailed evidence setting out the way that the Scottish Government international offices support trade, jobs and vital business connections. The report also refers in positive terms to the working relationship with the FCDO in overseas posts, and I look forward both to continuing to promote Scotland's interests and to working with UK government counterparts. I thank the Cabinet Secretary. The framers of the Scotland Act were clear that the reservation of international relations does not have the effect of precluding the Scottish ministers and officials from communicating with other countries, regions or international or European institutions, so long as the representatives of the Scottish Parliament or the Scottish ministers do not purport to speak for the United Kingdom or to reach agreements which come out of the UK. So can the Scottish Government confirm that uh, it would seem the Government here is being accused of not respecting the devolved settlement for clarity? Can the Cabinet Secretary can confirm whether the First Minister or indeed any other Minister has purported to commit the UK to any international agreement? Cabinet Secretary. Well, firstly, Do Dr uh, Allen was actually quoting from the explanatory notes around the uh, Scotland Act, so it's a statement of fact in his question. In answer to the question specifically, no Scottish Government Minister has or would purport to speak for the United Kingdom or to reach agreements which commit the UK. In fact, I asked James Cleverley for any examples of such a thing. He said he had none. We invite FCDO officials to attend our formal meetings. It's impossible to predict where and when informal meetings will happen during large-scale events like COP28, and to threaten Scotland's interests on the basis of these discussions arranged at pace is ridiculous. Alice the engagement presiding officer that Scotland undertakes with our international partners plays a key role in helping to attract inward investment and to promote brand Scotland. That is now being uh, threatened by an unelected Lord for the sake of the UK's politics of insecurity and petulance. So does the Cabinet Secretary agree that regardless of one's view on the Constitution, anyone who cares about the standing of this Parliament should recognise and call out this attempt at muzzling Scotland's elected institutions. Cabinet Secretary. <clears throat> well, anyone in doubt of the benefits of um, our work overseas should take a look at the report on the work of Scotland's international network, which highlights the real benefits being delivered to Scotland now. And trying to limit that work will only reduce the opportunities for Scottish businesses, cultural organisations and individuals and in so doing, impact ne uh, negatively on the lives of us all. Supplementary, Donald Cameron. While Scottish ministers clearly have a role to play in promoting Scotland abroad, that should never infringe on the devolution settlement, which of course reserves foreign affairs to the UK government. And by meeting with President Erdogan, of all people, yeah, yeah. to discuss foreign policy, namely the situation in the Middle East, the First Minister acted against both the spirit and letter of an established protocol that requires F FCDO official attendance and is crucially a requirement that applies equally to UK ministers as it does to Scottish ministers. So can I ask him this? Given that his government's own annual report highlighted a number of good examples of joint international working by officials from Scotland's two governments, where FCDO support has been critical, will he now give a firm commitment that all future Scottish Government meetings with overseas officials will have a representative from the Foreign Office present. Cameron, <clears throat> so uh, Donald Cameron, Cameron has brought up the, 
the letter of uh, the law. And the Scotland Act states very clearly, so let, let me quote again to the Chamber what it says. The reservation of international relations does not have the effect of precluding the Scottish ministers and officials from communicating with other countries, regions or international or European institutions so long as the representatives of the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish ministers do not purport to speak to the United, for the United Kingdom or to reach agreements which commit the UK. I have always, I have always been happy to be accompanied by uh, representatives of the UK embassies or high commissions whenever I undertake international meetings. That is the position of the Scottish Government. It's unfortunate that FCDO officials sometimes do not make themselves available. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. That concludes topical questions.